Yes. So none of the families of the girls uh, protest to the government what happened to my daughter? Most of the, most of the girls, I'm not going to say most of them, but many of the girls came from <coughs> orphanages, came from family homes, oh. came from places like, we had one girl um, who was actually, the journalist that I worked with, Hedi Pabdasarian, um, he had been doing some work with one of the children's homes. And this girl, specifically, she was one of the subjects that he had been working with, him and the psychologist. And we found out that she was over there. And we actually followed her. We actually, I spoke with her. Um, we never were able to actually get her into a hotel room because it just, it never worked for some reason. But she had actually been tricked. She had been taken over there. And she was pregnant, actually, when she went with her boyfriend's child. And when she went there, there was a doctor. His name is Bikram Bendikyan. He was the one that performed the, uh, the, the abortion. Yet he's not an abortion. I mean, he's not a an OBGYN, he's not a gynecologist, he's a, his specialty is Vax and whatever, he's an orthopedic doctor, I guess. And we actually interviewed him when we were there. We went to his office under false pretenses, as we did with most everybody. Um, and basically, we you know, were able to expose all of this whole group. The one, the one group that you saw that Anahi, Eshmiazi and Ano, she was being protected by uh, Mambil Grigorian, he's a general in the Armenian army. He's known as, he's known as, I don't know what they call him now, I can't remember, but he's a pretty vicious person. Anyway, she was under his protection. And so when we exposed her, and we knew she was untouchable, we knew that for sure. We had actually brought back, tripped over some of the, the pimps and some of the traffickers who were tried in court, but they would always get off. Um, one of them paid $150,000 just for her individual self to the prosecutor general's office. And the other one was a group of six, I believe, and they collectively, it was like $150,000. They all got off. Uh, but Anahi, she didn't get off that easy. We knew she was untouchable. So when we exposed her, we believe her traffickers were the ones who killed her. She actually got killed in September of 2005, just a few months after the documentary was made. She had a car accident, and she was driving a rented Honda. But if you had seen Anahi, I saw her. I actually got her, I, she actually yelled at me one time because I came to their house, knocked on the door, looking for Susie, and she yelled at me from the balcony, basically, and she was this very large woman with a very small head, and she had her accident, and she was done with. The other thing that we did expose um, after the documentary was made was somebody from the United Nations office in Yerevan, the anti-human trafficking department, who was a former prosecutor general's office employee amongst that same group of people that were involved. Um, we exposed him. We knew actually that he was involved prior to him even getting his job at the UN. And Lise Garandi, the head of the mission, was warned, pre-warned, that this man is part of the trafficking ring. And unfortunately, he was hired. But later on, October 18th, I got a visit from somebody from the State Department in Yerevan. And she informed me, or somebody from the embassy informed me, uh, that they were going to get rid of this Rafael, who was the part of the trafficking ring. I had asked at that time on October 18th, what happened with the sanctions? Because what happens is the, U the, the uh, State Department, they have a list of traffickings in person report. It's a trafficking in person report. And uh, Dubai was put on the worst list you could possibly get on. They were supposed to get sanctions and so on and so forth. I asked them what happened with the sanctions, and the woman from the State Department said, Condoleezza Rice and George Bush had a fight. She described it as a fight. Condoleezza Rice was pushing for sanctions. George Bush wanted to waive sanctions, and George Bush won. So sanctions were waived, and a couple years later I found out most probably the reason why was Halliburton, the uh, military contractors, were moving their corporate offices to Dubai to avoid being audited, basically, for their billions of dollars that they had stolen. So again, here we have a situation where you've got a country where there, there were, there are, there may be more, 2,000 Armenian girls, women and children, being held there against their will, including amongst them are Russians, Chinese. I mean, I ran into every type of ethnicity you could possibly imagine. I would guess about 50,000 women and children are in the Emirates for sex trafficking. And that's to take care of, at least. Because Armenians had over 2,000. So you figure amongst all those ethnicities, and there's over 1,000 hotels, and they're there for one reason and only one why they have so many hotels. It's the playground for the Arab nations.
you know. So yes. Yes. Yes, I do. Yes, and I. We will at some point. At some point, we will have to do that. We've been trying to do it. Actually, Avram Hovsepian, he was implicated a long time ago. He denied it, but never pressed charges against us. And I've been waiting for him to, because of our resources, our limited resources, my best defense is them coming after me, and then I can counter them. Because for me to actually try to go through the legal system in Armenia, it's almost impossible because they're in control of the legal system. Yes. Second, uh, second question that I asked. The first part is a statement that all countries have, yeah, all countries have similar problems, including the United States, that is female trafficking in the States, including Armenians that are brought here for that specific purpose. Uh, so there are problems, and uh, civilized nations uh, deal with their problems in a fashion to eliminate it, to limit the damage that's done. And you've done a good job at exposing the problem. What are you doing as a follow-up to eliminate the problem or to encourage the nation to face the problem or to raise the moral uh, consciousness to limit the damage that could be done? Well, the documentary that we did put together, as I said, uh, was intended not so much to punish as it was to bring awareness to the populace of Armenia so they would understand that this threat does exist and to be cautious of uh, what could happen to them if they go overseas, leave the country, just to keep their eyes out. And it's not just women that are being trafficked. Men are being trafficked also for labor. And a lot more men than women. As far as women trafficking for sex, there's more men that have been trafficked for labor trafficking to Russia, construction, things of that nature. Spain, I'm not sure what countries have it because we really haven't looked deeply into this. But getting back to your question, um, there are a lot of organizations now. After we did our documentary, a lot of organizations had already kind of started to address some of these issues, but more popped up as a result of that. And again, I'm an investigative journalist, so I'm not really in a position so much to actually, I'm willing to go after these people, and I have in the past, um, under different circumstances, under not necessarily trafficking, just corruption in general. But the reality is, is that because the system which has to punish them is under their control, it's almost impossible to actually get a conviction. Until today, for the adoption thing, there was supposed to be an investigation after our first report in 2003 of looking into who has to be punished. No one got punished, nobody got punished. And in fact, it continued after that under a different shroud, under a different method. Um, <coughs> actually, this woman after, uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Ara, for your presentation. You know, all my life, I have been so proud of being Armenian and so happy I'm Armenian. Tell me what there is to be proud of in Armenia. All I hear is <coughs> corruption, dishonesty, no morality. Tell me something good for me to be proud of. For you to be proud of? You need to be proud of the 98% of the people that aren't involved in this stuff. The 98% of the people that are living in Armenia, that are that are leading an honest life, and that are struggling, yes, because of all this corruption. But nonetheless, the majority of the people in Armenia are not involved in any of this type of thing. The majority of the people in Armenia are not involved in criminal activity. The majority of the Armenians in Armenia are Armenians, the Armenians that we should all be proud of. The ones that aspire to be good people. The ones that work towards uh, things that we should be proud of. You know, we have educational institutions, yes, it has, they have their problems, but there's always a bright star that comes out of them somehow, even under the worst conditions. If you look at Armenia today, the educational institution, it's horrendous, it's horrendous. Um, most schools are run by a 10-year-old whose father is some mafioso. And nonetheless, those children under those conditions of being bullied by some little twerp who's smaller than them, but has enough power because his daddy is somebody, or his uncle is a minister, or who knows who's, who they're related to. This is actually a reality. Almost every school in Yerevan, if not in the regions, has somebody bullying even the teachers. These kids bully the teachers. But still, these kids come out with an education. These kids, under the worst conditions, our children 
are actually coming out with some sort of education which you would have to scratch your head and go, how are they able to do that? Because Armenians genetically have it in them to strive for greatness, even under the most adverse conditions. Look at the genocide. How did our ancestors survive? Because we have it in us. This is really just a speed bump right now that we're falling over. And we all have to be aware of the situation, and we all have to be ready to do what we can with our resources, our limited resources. Each individual needs to take it amongst themselves. If you want to be a proud Armenian, let's create an Armenia that we can really be proud of. How? How? It's very simple. They're if, so entrenched. <clears throat> we're not that entrenched. The Armenia, if Armenia wants to get fixed, if we get the, the right leadership, and not the leader, leadership, somebody that can guide the leadership, and that's us. That's the people over there. Those that can put on the pressure, because one thing that I've learned about Armenia, and it's, I've been very successful in using me in, in the past, it's a little bit less effective now than it was in the beginning. It's the word amot. I've noticed that if you go to a government official with an issue, and I've dealt with a lot of issues, literally thousands of issues over the last 10 years, more than 10 years, you make a phone call and you bring it to their attention, that in your department, this, this, this is going on, this person is being prosecuted, this person is being harassed. Once they know that the, the cat's out of the bag and somebody knows about it, immediately, just from embarrassment, it doesn't work as well today, as I said, but it still does work to a certain degree. It just takes a little bit more of a push. The people that are doing these things, they're not horrible people. They're just bad, misguided people that need to be straightened out, that need to have you know a little bit of direction given. And that's what we, yes.